Tim and I are both going to talk about our experiences, more or less following in the footsteps of, of, of Wallace in our pursuit of uh, finding and documenting birds of paradise in the wild. Wallace's search for the birds of paradise began in early 1857, when, after three years exploring the western parts of the Malay archipelago, he made his way to the legendary Aru Islands. In mid-May, after two months collecting in the forests of the island's interior, Wallace returned to town and added a postscript to a letter that he had begun back in March. In it, he wrote, Rejoice with me, for I have found what I have sought. One grand hope in my visit to the Aru Islands is realized. I have got the birds of paradise. Years later, when Wallace recounted this accomplishment in the Malay Archipelago, he wrote, Thus, one of my objects in coming to the Far East was accomplished. I had obtained a specimen of the kingbird of paradise. <clears throat> Wallace called the kingbird of paradise a thing of beauty. It's not hard to appreciate why. It was the first bird of paradise he had encountered, and he was elated. <clears throat> His description of how he felt upon seeing the first specimen certainly ranks up there <clears throat> among some of the most poetic and impassioned passages in all of the Malay Archipelago. It's too long to quote here, but I encourage you all to read it uh, if you haven't already. After his success in the Aru Island, Wallace was hooked. He had become the first Englishman to see birds of paradise in the wild and to obtain high quality specimens of them. He also became the first Western naturalist to see them display, which gave new context to the bizarre and beautiful plumes that they were famous for. As Wallace continued in a subsequent line of that letter, I have discovered their true attitude when displaying their plumes, which I believe is quite new information. They are then so beautiful and grand. Their unparalleled beauty and apparent rarity combined with the opportunity for discover that they presented seems to have ignited a fire in Wallace, uh, which drove him to embark on an ambitious quest to try to find and document as many species as he, as he could. The start of our pursuit of the birds of paradise was a little different than Wallace's. Our first for foray in Wallace's footsteps together was the year 2004, nearly 150 years after Wallace's start in the Aru Islands. Tim and I joined forces as a part of Tim's assignment for National Geographic magazine. At that time, I was a graduate student and I was using video as a tool for researching bird of paradise behavior and evolution. I also had a few less gray hairs back then. And I had a few years exp field experience with a handful of species, about a dozen or so, in Papua New Guinea. And I had recently received a grant from National Geographic, which is how Tim came to find out about me and my work. At that time, Tim was well into his successful career as a wildlife photojournalist, with a particular expertise in the biodiversity of that part of the world, part of the world we've been talking about a lot today, Wallacea. This, his expertise began uh, with his field research uh, while working on his dissertation in the rainforest of Borneo. In addition to giving him an opportunity to hone his skills as a photographer, those years of field research also resulted in Tim being, becoming fluent in Indonesian and becoming a world-class tree climber, both of which are uh, really important things when chasing birds of paradise. Our goal was similar to Wallace's, to find the birds of paradise and document them in the wild and their extraordinary uh, appearance and behavior through our observations and our collections. Our collections were a distinctly modern variety, digital photographs and audiovisual recordings, and our collecting tools were ones that Wallace couldn't have even imagined. And as Tim will share with you in a bit, our field experiences, at least at times, were remarkably parallel. In order for Wallace to find and collect the birds of paradise, he had to try to go everywhere that he thought they would be found. Including his voyage to Aru, this led to multiple expeditions to rarely visited places throughout the New Guinea region and occupied the better part of five years. That's five years out of his eight in the Malay Archipelago. In the end, Wallace was left feeling a little bit disappointed uh, because he had uh, only, uh, according to his own accounting, he thought that he had only collected five species uh, in, that, in those five years. But to be fair, it should be noted that he actually encountered seven species. This one here was previously unknown to be a bird of paradise until he collected it. And another wasn't considered to be a bird of paradise until many years later. And I actually like to credit him for eight because uh, members of his team, Mr. Allen in particular, uh, actually collected a, another species that Wallace didn't have direct field experience with. Our pursuit of the birds of paradise took us everywhere in the world that uh, we now know that they occur. 
Uh, this included most of the places that, that Wallace visited, but also a much larger part of the New Guinea region and into Australia as well. One of the first things Wallace did upon <clears throat> returning to England in, in April 1862 was to sort through his journals and prepare a paper titled Narrative of Search After Birds of Paradise. I find this significant because it highlights just how emblematic these birds have become in his time abroad. In it, he recounts the many challenges he faced, he faced in finding the birds of paradise. He wrote, nature seems to have taken every precaution that these, her choicest treasures, may not lose value by being too easily obtained. First, we find an open, harborless, inhospitable coast exposed to the full swell of the Pacific Ocean. Next, a rugged, mountainous country covered with dense forests, offering in its swamps and precipices and serrated ridges an almost impassable barrier to the central regions. In such a country are found these wonderful productions of nature. The birds of paradise, whose exquisite beauty of form and color and strange developments of plumage are calculated to excite wonder and admiration of the most civilized and the most intellectual of mankind and to furnish inexhaustible materials for study to the naturalist and for speculation to the philosopher. Like Wallace, we too wanted to share our narrative of search for the birds of paradise. And so shortly after returning home from our last expedition, we dug through our field journals and tallied up some interesting facts and created this short video. We call it Birds of Paradise Project by the Numbers. These are the eight birds of paradise that Wallace observed or collected. And I'm happy to report that we were successful. Here are the 39 species that we successfully documented so many years later. So what is it about the birds of paradise that drives people like Wallace and ourselves to devote so many years in search of them? Well, a big part of their appeal is really uh, exhibited in this, in this image here. It's the sheer variety of shapes, sizes, color, form and, and behavior, all within one family of birds. But now I want to take you on a little detour and talk a little bit about the ways in which we actually didn't follow in Wallace's footsteps. It actually has to do with what you see here. 
<clears throat> this is a, a female bird of paradise. It's a female paradise rifle bird from Australia. And you can see females look very different from the males. They are much less extravagant, almost plain in appearance. Females build and tend the nest all by themselves. They typically lay one egg and they provide all the parental care uh, without any help from the male. Males, on the other hand, they're basically uh, courting machines. They spend huge amounts of time trying to attract and mate with as many females as possible since they be, uh, provide nothing to the next generation uh, beyond their uh, DNA. Females play a critical role in the evolution of the birds of paradise. And this is where we diverge from, from Wallace in a philosophical sense. Our divergence revolves around uh, what you see here in this photograph. See all those, those females lined up there on that, on that branch? Those are females Corolla's parodias, and they're all observing the, the male uh, display below. Uh, this is sexual selection by female choice in action. Those females, like the countless generations of females before them, are acting in a sense as the arbiters of evolution. Because females are able to choose any male that they want as a mate, and since preference amongst most females tends to converge on the same males, like you see here, Mating success ends up being highly skewed towards a handful of chosen ones, like this lucky fellow. And the traits that these females found so attractive will be overrepresented in the next generation relative to his competitors. As you can see, one of those competitors is, is uh, one of the unlucky outsiders there on the front of the screen. And there's another just in the back if you look carefully through the, through the leaves. Although I believe it was Wallace who coined the phrase female choice, uh, we all know it was Charles Darwin who proposed it as a solution for the many observations that simply didn't make sense in, the, in light of natural selection. Things like beautiful plumes, bizarre displays that appeared extravagant and excessive. Darwin said these traits didn't evolve through natural selection, but through a process of aesthetic evaluation by females, and that they didn't serve any purpose beyond being attractive. For as open-minded as we know Wallace to be now, uh, it seems that he never really came around to Darwin's um, ideas on female choice. He cast early seeds of doubt before Darwin had even fin finished writing about sexual selection in The Descent of Man. In a letter Wallace wrote to Darwin, one difficulty to me is that I do not see how constant minute variations, which are sufficient for natural selection to work with, could be sexually selected. How can we imagine that an inch on the tail of a peacock or a quarter inch in that of a bird of paradise, would be noticed and preferred by the female. Later, especially after, after Darwin's death in Wallace's later years, his, his critique of female choice became even more vigorous. It seems as though Wallace, even with his firsthand experience uh, with the true attitudes of birds of paradise, couldn't accept female mating choices as having a substantial evolutionary impact. Wallace preferred a purer form of Darwinism, where the evolution of, of everything could be explained by natural selection alone, and sexual selection seemed to compromise that. Wallace believed that male ornaments could evolve through natural selection as, as signals, to quote Wallace, of health, vigor, and general fitness to survive. While rarely acknowledged, his view was actually quite similar to what has become mainstream thinking about female choice over the last 30 or 40 years, in which elaborate traits evolve as indicators of genetic quality. Some have even argued recently that, is, that much of modern sexual selection theory is actually more Wallacean in nature than Darwinian, which is interesting food for thought and would be a good topic for another symposium. Yet both Wallace and Darwin's views provide guidance on our journey. Wallace showed us that in order to make sense of the extraordinary beauty, the birds of paradise have to be observed behaving naturally in the wild. And Darwin showed us that because females are the arbiters of evolution, Perspective matters, and to fully appreciate and interpret ornamental traits, we must examine them in the context in which they evolved, that is, from the perspective displayed to the female. So now I'm going to close uh, today with a, with a story about a discovery, small discovery, but an interesting one nonetheless, that Tim and I made while documenting this species. I think it nicely illustrates our Wallacean quests and also our Darwinian departure. This is the male Wands is Parodia. It's not a species that Wallace encountered or even knew existed. It's actually found in the mountains of northeastern New Guinea, far from Wallace's stomping ground. But male Parodias, all of them, there's five species in the, in the genus, they all perform their courtship displays on a, on a patch of ground that looks like this. 
It's basically a stage, if you will, where the male has removed all the leaf litter and other forest debris and opened up that bear patch that you see there on the forest floor. Um, This is called his court. And all sites chosen as a court have at least one prerequisite. That is, they at least have one horizontal branch that spans the central part of the court there. And this branch serves as the the seating for the audience for the performance that's happening up, up on the stage. So typically, when we make observations on ground-displaying species like this or make photographs of ground-displaying species like this, this is what we do. We get our local assistants to go out into the forest, cut a bunch of uh, saplings and branches, and they make this thing called a blind. It's like a phone booth in the forest, and they cover it up with palms or ferns. And then we put our our cameras uh, (laughs) about where Tim's face is, and we're able to make our observations and document the displays um, just 10 or 15 feet away from, from the blind. And if we're lucky, this is what we'll see. This is the quintessential uh, display of a male parodia. This is called the uh, ballerina dance. Uh, And when seen from this perspective, you can see why. It looks like he's he's wearing a skirt or a tutu. Uh, But in fact, those are specialized feathers of his uh, breast, upper breast and flanks that are wrapped around his body. Those aren't his wings. Those are special feathers that make that, that skirt. But if you'll remember, The female actually uh, watches this display from a very different perspective. She's up above on that uh, branch that overhangs the court, and she's watching that behavior from above looking down. So to get you oriented with the basic components of this display, here's a practice display. There's no female there, but males routinely practice these behaviors. You can see he did a bow, and in an instant he transformed himself from something sort of bird-like into this ballerina skirt dancer. And look, even without a female there, look where he positioned himself. He's directly under that perch where the female would sit. And you can see he's got these six elongate uh, feathers on the top of his head that looks like little flies. Uh, They have little flat spatulate tips. Looks like flies buzzing around his head. And he's waggling his head back and forth. So this is is the basic view that you see when studying studying this uh, behavior from the ground view. And here's the uh, female of this species. Um, she's on the perch next to the male. Most of the male's displays don't happen on the perch. Um, and she's quite beautiful in her, in her own more subtle way. But on this particular expedition where we wanted to document this species, uh, we decided to try something new uh, and a little bit more complex. The goal was to try to put a camera uh, that could be remotely operated up into a tree right on the edge of the court. We had to find a court that had uh, a tree close enough nearby that we could conceal a camera there and have a view that more or less approximated the female's uh, view over her shoulder um, down to the male below her on the the court. Um, That was a a wide angle camera that was gonna also be remotely controlled off to the side. And then in the blind, uh, we had kind of the traditional setup where Tim was gonna man um, a big lens from farther away and be able to get tight close up shots from the front. And as you can see, there was a laptop there which served as the control center for operating the two remote cameras. So every morning and every afternoon, uh, Tim had to climb up on the tree next to the court to get the uh, camera in place and get it concealed, connect all the cables. This tree wasn't uh, big enough for him to climb with ropes. So we had our local field assistants go to the um, Jungle Home Depot and uh, put together a ladder out of bamboo and vines. And then we spent seven, eight hours a day, if it wasn't pouring rain, uh, together working in this uh, little blind. And um, you can see that's me manning the laptop there and no, I'm not checking my email or anything. I was basically just waiting. We were both just waiting for the, for the action to begin, the birds to, to show up. Usually Tim and I don't work together in the same lines. We kind of divide and conquer and spend time in separate observational blinds or I'll be out searching for other species while Tim is documenting them. So this was a bit of an unusual situation for us. So that's the view that I had from inside the laptop. You can see me hunched over there and looking. That's the the camera that's up in the tree that's approximating the female view. So let's take a look and see what the behavior looks like uh, from that camera. This is a little dark, but you can see a female actually shows up this time. So this is the real deal, uh, not a practice display. The male comes out. This is the same ballerina dance that you saw before. And he positions himself directly under the female. And of course, we knew it was gonna look a little bit different, right? We weren't um, you know, too naive and think that it wasn't gonna look different at all from the female's perspective. But actually, I think we were quite, quite shocked at just how different it really looked once we saw it from the perspective of the female. And in fact, you know, had we seen this before, seen this behavior from the context in which it evolved, 
uh, we probably wouldn't have called it the ballerina dance at all. We probably would have called it the wobbling ovoid display or something. It's very different. So let's go on down to the next stages uh, so you can see the other components. This is a practice display, um, but we're using it because it's got much better light. On the left here is going to be the, the, the tree camera. That's the female view. And on the right is the other wide camera on the ground. And uh, the video here is, is basically synced. So you can move your eye back and forth. So he comes out. He's got his skirt wrapped around him. You can see he positions himself under that spot where the female would be. And then he goes to this thing I call the dramatic pause. And then, boom, look at that. Did you see? Look at the female perspective again. What happens when he plunges his head down before he goes into that waggle? So all this time we had been looking at these really incredible iridescent feathers on his breast from the ground view and seeing him waggle his head back and forth and thinking that this shaking back and forth uh, of, those, of those feathers was a really visually impressive thing when it turns out, in fact, the female can't see those feathers at all. And it's only at this moment where he plunges his head down and lifts them up that she can see them. And what she sees is something very different uh, than what we see from the ground view or actually any other view that, that you might observe this bird from. So that was one interesting discovery. But then there was another one. I don't know if you noticed, but at the same time that he's plunging his head down in the back, all of a sudden there's this little bright thing moving around on the back of his head. It looks like he's got a, a reflector on his bicycle uh, on the back of his head, um, really tracing his head motions. And what this is is that all male parodias have another really highly iridescent uh, patch of feathers on the back of their head. And for years while studying them, I actually did a whole PhD dissertation studying behavior and evolution in, in the parodias never really had a context for how that ornament was used. There's a few behaviors where the, the males actually sidle up next to the females and they kind of move their head into them. And so I figured it must be just a little glimmer that was used there. And this actually was the more surprising discovery of the two um, because it was only from going through this effort of trying to put ourselves, put our equipment uh, into position to being able to see this extraordinary display from the perspective of the female, where we ever gave context to that ornament at all and appreciate these other um, extraordinary, beautiful aspects of this display. So I'm going to leave you there and hand you over to Tim. And Tim is going to tell you a bit more about our efforts uh, directly following in Wallace's footsteps through various places during our uh, many-year uh, journey. Thank you. <laughs>